Ivan Marie Mokam, as uh, you uh, Today we are going to hold the first event um, by the Africanists. There is a group of fac faculty members on campus uh, who study or teach about Africa, and they are called Africanists. So today we're holding our first event of, the, of this uh, academic year, and uh, our guests are uh, uh, is Ambroise Kahn. Uh, Professor Ambroise Kahn comes from uh, Toronto University. And in the middle, uh, Joe Tate from the History Department. And uh, Omedi Oshen, who is in the Communication Department. So today, the theme of the discussion will be what do African studies bring to, to the, the, the liberal arts? Thank you. Titled Groundwork for the Practice of the Good Life, 
Politics and Ethics at the Intersection of North, Afri North Atlantic and African Philosophy, published by Rutledge in 2016. Dr. Oshang has also published articles in such venues as the International Philosophical Quarterly, Radical Philosophy, Western Journal of Communication, and the African Journal of Rhetoric. And lastly, um, my name is Joe Teg. I'm an assistant professor in the history department here at Denison. My courses explore myth-making and the production of knowledge in pre-colonial Africa, Africa since 1880, women and gender, in African history, apartheid South Africa, and the history of humanitarianism. My research explores the nature of refugee settlement during the era of African liberation in the 1960s and 70s. And my books and articles unpack the arrival and livelihoods of Mozambican refugees in southern Tanzania in the 1960s and 1970s. I argue that this was a time when the international humanitarian community, African host states, and the displaced themselves viewed refugees as resources and as opportunities. And I'm interested in how this history of displacement has not only been silenced, but erased. So from our three very different um, disciplines then, we've envisioned today as a broad conversation about what African studies bring to the liberal arts. And as we were preparing um, for today, we contemplated one question that I wanted us to think about more broadly and to float out, which is what do we actually mean by the liberal arts? How do we define it? Um, and that's one question that we're gonna move to um, collectively. So I wanted to sort of throw a few thoughts that I have out there um, on how do we define the liberal arts, but also how do we define it in the context of what we mean by African studies and what African studies brings. <clears throat> One thing that resonated with me, um, and Professor Kahn spoke to this for those of you who attended his talk yesterday, was this distinction, this difference of education versus instruction. And that really resonated with me when I think about the liberal arts um, and, and what we do as Africanists. And to my mind, one of the beauty of the liberal arts and what African studies brings is this resuscitation of African voices and agency. Um, and one thing that gets me thinking about this is the inherent interdisciplinarity of African studies. Even though I have my PhD in history, even though we have our respective PhDs, as Africanists, we are trained interdisciplinarily. And so I can't possibly understand African family and livelihoods unless I draw on my training from anthropology and from sociology and the ways in which we resuscitate voices that way. Um, and to my mind, the second point, um, before I pass this to my esteemed colleagues, since I'm colonizing the meeting, um, <laughs> is I think that, that this interdisciplinarity really gets us thinking again about myth-making and the production of knowledge, but also the production of misinformation. And that's something that we have this luxury of contemplating in our classes here in these small groups, this idea of um, where do we see myths being originated um, and appropriated and knowledge being manipulated towards different ends. The final point I wanted to make before moving on, it was something we spoke about at dinner last night, was the importance of study abroad. Um, and <laughs> I see you're jumping at the bit. And so um, that's one thing that we were talking about and, and um, contemplating last night, about the importance of study abroad in the liberal arts um, context. So. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I, 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 I really resonate with what Professor Chai just pointed out. Um, so for me, if I were to define the liberal arts, I would think of it as a practice of learning as a way of life. A conception of learning as not just the absorption of information, not just the training into certain skills, those are important, but also as a conception of learning as a practice. And by practice, I, I really mean that a good liberal arts education enables you to face up to certain existential questions, right? such as, how shall we live? How shall we live together? What is justice? What is wisdom? What is beauty? What is the value of knowledge? 
What is a good society? How can we conceive of a good society in a global world? I, I really derive that notion of the liberal arts from the long intellectual traditions within Africa. So if you look at, for instance, the work of Odera Obuka, Kenyan philosopher, one of the things he does in his work is sort of distinguish. Oruka went out to various African communities to engage the philosophers within those African communities. And this is a context in which African philosophy has always been thought of as marginal or non-existent, at least amongst North Atlantic philosophers. You don't hear a lot of African philosophy engaged with it. So Ruka went out to those communities to talk with, engage African philosophers. And what he finds is he makes a distinction between what he calls a philosopher and the same. So the, the, the philosopher is interested in articulating general principles. And according to Oruka, the sage is concerned with how we ought to live together. And that always means that, that goes beyond knowledge to something he calls acknowledgement. That, that you can know something, but you don't really register it. And acknowledgement is this dawning realization and it's not only sort of intellectual, but it's sort of an embodied realization that I see you, I, I recognize you. I want to have a conversation with you. So, I suppose one aspect, one, one dimension to what I'm saying is a greater recognition of African intellectual tradition within the liberal arts here in the United States could be greatly enriching for our curriculum. And those African intellectual traditions are not all oral. Many of them are oral and very rich traditions, but we do know that from the 11th, 11th century, there was a very rich intellectual <coughs> literate tradition in places like in West Africa, in Timbuktu and so on. And East Eastern Africa, we know in, in Diaz and in Amharic and um, Arabic, there have been a lot of literate intellectual traditions that we can bring into our curriculum and to enrich our sense of what, what it means to live well. Okay. I have some other thoughts that are maybe more practical, but I can engage them a little later. But I think that's sort of a, an opening to how, how I conceive of the liberal arts and how African studies may be able to enrich our conceptions of how to live well. Thank you. It's a, my pleasure to be here this afternoon and to participate in this round table. First and foremost, uh, I would like to say a few words about African studies. Uh, I think it should be noted here that African studies in the United States were not really created by university scholars. African studies in the United States were initiated by the State Department in the in, in the 50s because foreign affairs in Washington realized that there was a missing link in, the, in the American university educational system that African studies was something missing. So it's the foreign affairs to stay the part that really push university scholars to create an association called African Studies Association <laughs> in order then to provoke or to bring them to the realization of the fact that African Studies should be an important part of 
the educational system of the American colleges and universities. I think this is extremely important. So, so the issue, what do uh, uh, African studies bring to liberal arts? You know, the answer is right there. It's, uh, it's extremely important to include the African studies in the liberal arts education. Now, coming back to what is liberal arts education. A lot of talk has already been said about that. And I would add much, except that I come from an educational system that has nothing, but nothing at all to do with liberal arts. I'm a French, very French system educator. My background, my primary, secondary college education was, you know, I, 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 I did it in Africa and in France. And I came to America just to teach. So I didn't know anything about liberal arts. And that's why I was making this distinction with my colleague between instruction and education. Because the French educational system has nothing to do with liberal arts. If you go back to the person who enacted that system of education, Jules Ferry, 18th century. He was, he created a ministry of instruction, not a ministry of, not a ministry of education, ministry of public instruction. And public instruction has nothing to do with what we call liberal arts. Instruction meaning that they teach you how to read, how to write, and how to count. That's it. They do not care about how you interact with your neighbor, how you become a good citizen. They don't care about your moral, your religion, whatever. Okay. So, and if you compare that to the liberal arts education that I discovered here, that claim, that pretend to uh, prepare a student to be a like a run very random person, a very you know, a whole citizen to become a whole citizen. What does it mean to be a whole citizen? <coughs> Meaning that you are not just in school to to learn how to write, how to count, and how to read, but you are also in school to learn how to interact, how to live in the community, how to interact with your neighbor, how to, how to judge, how to, how to be critical. You know, you, you, you know, critical thinking that comes very often in liberal arts. And my experience, you know, to see how this is practiced was when I I became, I, I went back to Africa to teach, and I received over years, when I was professor at the University of Yaoundé, I received many American students from Duke, from Brown, from several colleges who came as for their junior year abroad. And I really understood how the liberal arts background was influencing their stay in Cameroon. The type of question they were asking, the type of interaction they were having with their colleagues in school, the type of, you know, the relationship they were having with the Cameroonian professor who were French educated, who were just there to teach them how to read, how to write, and then well, Professor, you know, there is some kind of something missing. You know, we should, can we talk to you after class? Can we ask you a few questions about this, that, how people live, how the, the country politics operates? And I used to receive them, you know, when they arrive, and then have a debriefing with them at the end. 
and then we really learn a lot. And how Africa and how the stay in Africa influence the, the future. I will give you just a few examples. One day I have a student of mine who was from Duke University who was graduating in anthropology. And who came and I was supervising her her thesis because they always write a paper, a long paper that they bring back. Supervising her paper and she said, you know what, Professor? I'm going to change my major when I go back. I say, why? Why are you changing me? Say, the type of poverty I have seen around here, the type of suffering I have seen here with people, I think I'm not going to major in anthropology. I'm going to major, to change my major, in, uh, to get, take something that will allow me to go to medical school. Because I think in the future I should come back to Africa and practice medicine because this is extremely important to me. You know, if I can alleviate pain that people suffer here. This was her, her classmates, even in Africa, didn't, didn't even see this. But her liberal arts background has prepared her to be able to really interact with the population, interact with her classmate, and see what was important for her, what was important for students who were engaged in the kind of pursuit that she was she was in. So I I have many examples like this. I have students who came, who were graduating in French, and who got engaged in so much in African music. Because they discovered that the type of music they were studying here has not much to do with what the type, the music African people were, were used to producing. And she got involved so much in African music. And even engage in uh, uh, in club in town to play music to play the drums etc etc. So I think really the question: What do African studies bring to liberal arts education? Is not uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that it's a it's a useless question, obsolete. But you know this is, this is fundamental. And nowadays that we are going, that the world is going global, we say that you know, African studies, its place, it's really there. And that liberal arts education, even if, if, if African studies were in the periphery, it has now to be, to come down, to take its place in the center. Because the center needs the center needs need these African studies to be there. It has not it cannot be continued to be kept in the periphery. So that's fine. Um, I think one thing I, I wanted to sort of build on um, with what you were just talking about with students that you saw coming through your day is um, this importance of this ability to see what, what others don't see. Um, but also I think there's this tendency to feel uncomfortable um, in, in African studies. And whether you're um, studying abroad or living abroad, or if you come back with these experiences and knowledge that you have, there's there's an uncomfortability that always challenges us and that makes us feel at home. And I think that that's something that sort of resonated with me with, with what you were just saying, as I go on. So did you want to add more? You yeah, know, yeah. Copious notes. <laughs> I think that African studies often can contribute, add to, inflect your 
your knowledge can, can enrich your knowledge. But I think also African studies can do something that is not, not as emphasized, at least in a space like this, which is to, to help you realize that education is not just about gaining. Like I'm just, I come into Denison and I'm sort of just gaining these skills, okay? And you're gaining this knowledge. But that education can also be a process of unlearning, can be a process of losing, of recognizing what you are losing when you are, when you are being educated. So African studies can help you like have agency, like the person who comes and says, I want to help. But sometimes African studies can also help you realize that you are limits, the extent to which you cannot help other people, that you, those people need to help you, the extent to which you don't know, right? And I think, a lot of liberal arts education in the United States can be about this is what you're going to gain. This is how you're going to get all these other skills. But it doesn't tell you a lot about these are the things that you need to lose. These are the things that you are maybe losing without knowing that you're losing. And that these are your limits. These are the things that you cannot do by yourself. And so on. So I think there's that education as a process of loss, of failure, can be as important as education as a process of gaining. And I also think that African studies, it's a place where you capacity to deal with human diversity can really be tested. Because, you know, you say diversity in America. Okay, we know it all. Now. And most of them, when they study European history or European culture, well, it's so close intellectually to what America is. It's different, but it's still very close. But when you tackle Africa and African studies. Oh my God, it's so complex. Even in the, in the same country, the diversity in languages, in different practices, in, in the culture, music, and so on and so forth, is so complex. It really challenges you to be able to digest all these diversity. And I think whenever you know, I hear people here, you know, colleagues here, like my colleague, African history. But what do you mean by African history? You can talk about history of maybe Tanzania or South Africa. But history of South Africa itself is so complex <coughs> yeah. that you cannot, because you, you, you cannot there. So when you talk about African history generally, oh my gosh, I say, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> and if you go to African languages, linguists who study African languages, you know, most of the time they just get, take one example, well, you cannot talk about African languages. You talk, uh, say you do linguistics and you apply it to maybe not even one country, one dialect within a country. It's, so really, to, to, to sum up, it, it just gives you the possibility to, to deal with you, your capacity to deal with diversity and the, the complexity of knowledge. Of course, if knowledge is complex, philosophy is complex, religion is complex, but when you go to Africa and you start to study anthropology, uh, well, be really, really ready to be prepared to get into the complexity because from one village to another, it changes so much. You can ask yourself, how have people of a generation been dealing with this 
and they say they are under developed and they don't understand. You know, this is this is a challenge to you people who say, okay, we we know we we are from the first world. We have the capacity to digest now lots of knowledge in a very short span of time. But it's not that easy. This is this is what I would I would like to add to challenge you capacity to digest diverse and to deal with diverse. So we have really hoped that today would be conversational. Um, we anticipate that you all have a lot of questions about this enormous topic, about the enormous <coughs> diversity and complexity that, that we all grapple with, that we bring here. Um, and so we thought we could spend about 20, 30 minutes opening up to conversation um, with you and any questions that you might have. So I have a question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, the liberal arts? It seems like uh, there is. Oh, yeah. no, you need to use the mic. Oh, oh, okay. So could you um, talk a little bit more about uh, the liberal arts and maybe liberal arts in Africa? It seems like people who come from the West uh, because of their education in liberal arts. Uh, are able to better connect with uh, creating knowledge and learning from Africa, but um, the tradition of, of Africans before colonization maybe was very much connected to liberal arts, but the new universities are very much a product of colonialism. Where do people in Africa continue their let's say, former liberal arts education. Right, that's, that's one of the reasons why I want to emphasize this immersion in alternative intellectual traditions in Africa. The long intellectual traditions in Africa that have I don't think been engaged with adequately, partly because colonial and post-colonial education was, continues to be deeply oriented to instruction rather than education. Partly because those kinds of knowledges that are those kind of intellectual traditions that do not, that cannot be easily assimilated into this North Atlantic tradition are often radical knowledges, right? As Oluka points out, they are, they are radical in, this, in the form of, imagine trying to conceive of education as a way of life, of learning as a way of life. How, how radically would we have to change the way we do things here at NSA? I think very radically. And so that those kinds of knowledges exist, but either are suppressed or that many of them like look at the we're now just we're now just starting to, to digitize and try to recover a lot of the manuscripts that either were lost or were hidden in private collections in Timbuktu, in uh, the Swahili coast, in Ethiopia, and so on. So if we conceive of, it, if we conceive of the liberal arts, at least one, one, one definition of the liberal arts as learning as a way of life, then I, I don't think we're going to see, see the liberal access in some way foreign to Africa. Okay. Um, but it will take a lot, it will take a lot of immersion in this 
intellectual, uh, intellectual traditions that are often marginalized. And it will take, it will involve going beyond what we think of right now as the formal educational systems in many parts, in many countries in Africa, to engage other fugitive forms of knowledge, um, say philosophy. Yeah, that's uh, uh, the question you asked, according to me, is very interesting. But I didn't really want to get into that because mm -hmm. uh, I might have the impression that I am asking you to, to valorize, to positivize certain African way of doing things, which is not really my mission here. Because what you are saying, if we compare the traditional African way of learning, which was fundamentally oral. And through oral tradition, everything was, it was only liberal arts before, before time. Oral tradition, through oral tradition, the communication included everything. <laughs> include philosophy, include moral, include economy, include literature. Everything was there in the oral tradition, the way it was transmitted. But with colonization, say, well, no, oral traditions, if you don't write, if, if it's not written, you know, that means it does not exist. That's why, say, well, you, we have no past, no present, and no future. Okay. But, if you look at the world, uh, the way the world is going today, where we are, in a way, we are going back to oral, you know, oral culture. We are going back there with the new techniques of communication. Everything is oral, and even where well, the student here will not, will not say I'm, that that what I'm saying is not true. They what they, they they don't feel like writing that much. They want less and less. They want oral communication, telephone, okay, uh, email, send email, send SMS. You know, but we are going back to oral culture, oral tradition. So what Africa is bringing to liberal arts is also, if we may go back and study the way oral communication was structured. Oral communication was organized that we would learn a lot. So that's another, that another aspect of what African studies can bring to liberal arts. Orality. How did orality work? How did orality, how did orality perform? And that we may have a lot to learn. I think sort of building on that as well, um, I, I struggle with this idea that um, that the colonial project completely <clears throat> disrupted oral traditions. Um, and of course it didn't. Um, and so one thing that, that I think in our current moment, we were talking about last night as well, is this importance more than ever of accessing um, African voices and African histories via via oral traditions, and that these mechanisms that colonial states and administrations put in place to sort of block African voices were not successful. Right? We still um, go to these fugitive intellectual traditions, and we listen um, more than we sort of glean anything out of a written archive. Um, and so that's one thing that that's always struck me that we assume that there's this bifurcation between oral tradition and the written archive, when in fact the, the, the obstacles that we find in the written archive allow us, or they push us, to listen to African voices um, and lived realities. Yeah, thank you. I wondered if the three of you could envision an African studies program at a place like Denison. Um, everything from the kind of vision to the mechanics. 
are there certain fields you feel would have to be covered, certain number of faculty to do it? And related to that, do you know of any program in the United States that you feel is a vibrant and successful African Studies program? In the liberal arts specifically? Yes. Yeah, I, I, we can't be our one institution. <laughs> I mean, I'll start my, um, as my colleagues pontificate. Um, one thing that I think is crucial in terms of an African studies curriculum is language. Um, and that for everything that history and rhetoric and anthropology, um, economics, political science, right, all this interdisciplinarity and everything that it brings, um, I personally find it imperative that those of us who um, live and, and work in Africa do so with um, a grounding in African language. Um, and so my, my thinking of, of, about a place of denizen, when I think about um, the strength that we bring and, and this incredible curriculum that we have, if I think about, okay, where can somebody study Zulu or um, or Swahili, um, I come back to that and then immediately I think, oh, the internet, right? It's out on Google's, so, um, but of course that's not the same as, you know, you can't take Duolingo and um, become sort of proficient in these languages. But I'm increasingly struck at the imperative to, if you're going to work in Tanzania or Kenya, you have to be fluent um, in order to listen to those voices. So I come back to that often um, as, as something that I think about. I agree. I think that language, I could not emphasize language enough. One of, one of my interests that I've been talking about a lot is how various disciplines and fields are, have a certain kind of imagination who forms an imagination within your field, who articulates the theoretical paradigms that reign within your field, what are the philosophical assumptions embedded in your methods and so on. And I come back to how in the North Atlantic world, you, don't, you hardly ever see a serious engagement with African philosophers and thinkers, theorists, people who speculate about the, the possible. I see a lot of Africanists in their work citing Foucault, or if they are analytic philosophers, they are citing, they could cite any number of analytic materials. But again, you hardly see a serious engagement with African theorists and thinkers as setting the Questions, asking questions that, asking questions about the questions we ask. So, we need to, if if we were to, I think, take African studies seriously, it would be an engagement. I hope with, first of all, creating room for Africans to speculate, to think. In our classrooms with our students, but also being responsive to Odera Oluka, to Sophie Oluwole, uh, to Kirun Zegu, all these other thinkers that ask fundamental questions about why we are, how we are learning what we are learning, why we are learning what we are learning. So, yeah, theory, uh, thinking, speculation. Well, specifically, I would think that uh, for African studies to to be, uh, you know, to be rooted in a place like this, I think. Apply linguistics should be something not only valid for African.
languages, but an applied linguist can help with European languages, but also show rooms how you can approach these African languages. And I think this is this is this is a theme. And I have worked a lot with Boston University students who come to Cameroon to study African languages. But they do apply linguistic and each of them choose to apply it to any language he or she likes. And some of them who have decided to apply it to Cameroonian languages come to Cameroon and do it and I see how it operates. I think this is something that I think is very, very productive and very successful. Uh, mention that there is quite a lot of resources. We have quite a lot of resources on campus uh, who are doing already doing African studies. And the reason why we decided to put together this group is actually to make it visible. Uh, we have a strong Black Studies department who is doing, that is do, already doing the diaspora version. We have uh, a professor in anthropology, sociology, uh, uh, English, who are already doing what we're doing. Right, so separate groups, we have people in separate departments who are doing, uh, who are studying African studies already. Uh, it's just a matter of making it visible and making it, uh, maybe, uh, a present, have a strong present that is visible. For example, Linda, you do uh, diaspora, right? I mean, we, we have resources, a strong group, resources, black students, that are doing, already doing, uh, what is that going to say? We just have to make it visit more visible. That's, that's my thing. Um, yeah, I like the arguments that you made about education being a process of losing. Um, leaving behind knowledge maybe that we subscribe to. And then the second argument that um, to really be more educated with respect to Africa, we would also need to think about the categories through which we come to know what we know. And um, I was thinking about that in light of the question that was asked about are there best case African studies programs in the U.S. And I uh, want to ask um, what your views would be if I were to state the following, that there are no such programs in the United States, African studies programs that do both of those things as programs and in terms of their mission statement. Do you think that's an overstatement? What are your views? Are you following the question I'm asking? But what are the two things, Susan? Pardon me? What are the two things? That are no the one is leaving things. knowledge behind. Uh huh. So thinking outside of the way in which we usually think is what I understood you to say. Mm -hmm. um, outside, we could say European constructs of knowledge about Africa. Um, and then. The second issue is um, to think about the cat, and it's related, is the categories by which we structure even the idea of African studies. Because you started to begin with to say that, to ask us, uh, to ask the question, well, where did African studies come from originally? And it came from the State Department. It didn't come from Africa. Is the question too general? No, Sorry. it's a very good question. I I'm sort of in this position of saying, yeah, yes, no, there's no, there are no programs that I, that come to mind that I would say 
I suppose I, I want to be also self-critical here. That I am also not myself. I'm also not myself as robustly engaged, as robustly immersed in African studies as I would want. And maybe that comes down to a question of what would it mean to reimagine, what would it mean to really radically reimagine African studies? What would it mean to look to 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 be educating not only for gain but also for loss? I'm not sure I have an answer, I don't think I have an answer, and that would remind us of a collective project, a collective conversation. I'm listening rather than just a speaking. I think the one thing that I'm sort of struck with um, in this origination of, of African studies um, as being located in U.S. foreign policy and, and the State Department is there. there is an alternate um, but parallel lineage, which is the birth of African studies as being motivated through activism and through activists. Um, and, you know, that, that's something when, when I think about that question, um, when I think of this lineage of, you know, the first part of your question, right, how do we grapple with, with unlearning, right, or with losing information, misinformation. Um, I think that, that there are programs that have rallied that history of African studies as, as activists. Um, and I think it's those programs that are still some of the strongest. Um, Boston University, as Professor Kong mentioned, Berkeley used to have sort of this incredible um, African studies program because it dovetailed this lineage of activism with um, resuscitating lost narratives. <clears throat> but I think it's an important question that gives me pause in terms of where the state of the field is at the moment, right? We have these sort of linchpin programs. Um, and is it a question of are we doing this better at small liberal arts colleges? Um, I think of Oberlin and, and what Oberlin is doing now, which is exciting. Um, I think of Bryn Mawr College which has, again, people who are interested in this activist history with finding these fugitive histories, right, these lost histories. So I think that's an interesting way of sort of merging um, the history of African studies with the current state. Other questions? Um, Sort of going off of this, but taking it in a little bit different direction. Um, you know, it seemed to me that that um, some of what's important about what you're all talking about with African studies is also how it um, changes U.S. studies and U.S. history. And for me, that's part of what I also see as very important being somebody who teaches U.S. studies. Um, and it seems like there's two things. On the one hand, you know, with all the um, ways that Atlantic history is now being formulated, so that the ways the, the narratives of the you know, discovery and creation of America, so that narrative is being changed partly by thinking in terms of what Africans were doing and the interactions between African people and Europeans and American Indians, rather than just as a European history. Um, so it seems to me that that's one important sort of decentering that, that African history does is remind people in the US we're not the center of the world or even our own history in certain ways. But at the same time that it also, and, and I mean, and what you were saying about US history being European or US culture being European. I mean, I think in so many ways we talk about um, US culture and politics and history and traditions as European, 
But obviously, there's many ways that African traditions and culture have shaped who we are, too. And so it seems to me that another important thing we can get from African studies is to see how those are part of who we are, actually, in the US also. So do you see ways that your teaching in the US and in the Americas as part of that process also of reminding us all on this continent of both the fact that we're not the center of the universe and something we do forget here in the US sometimes. Um, and also to sort of remind us of our communal Africanness in certain ways. background in European, uh, European history. How do I start? I mean, it's, it's a question that we would really grapple with. Um, uh, introducing uh, culture, in Af a culture that is so foreign to the uh, realm of reference, it's, it's hard. And, and they either get something, and I was telling you an anecdote yesterday, to, uh, a whole semester, with the students teaching them how African voices, using women voices. At the end of the semester, the student came up with a question for her essay, is education, is education a good thing for an African, an African girl? And, and for me, that was a sign that throughout the semester, it did not register. So how possible do you teach students who have a background in European, a European background, the cultures that are so foreign from that, their own, to the point that they can unlearn, actually. Unlearn, uh, because most knowledge is like people have about Africa is the one that is either Hollywood or the media. And what the media give us is mostly war, AIDS, famine, right? So how do you teach students to unlearn that? when you are in it. It's a, it's a very interesting one. Which I have no answer. <laughs> right, and, 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 the, and how do we think of this as a collective, as an institution? You know? To unlearn is painful. To unlearn involves a lot of, it can involve conflict. To unlearn can often be, for many students, bewildering. Is Denison willing to put resources in that teaching and go against a lot of its practices, including things like student evaluations that often ask questions like, did you learn a lot in this class? I learned a lot doing that. I mean, I to, I'm just talking about the disruptiveness. That this, this is not just an individual activity of me going into the classroom. Because that then will involve, you know, I will be sort of the bad guy here. But as an institution, as a, as a, call, as a university, can we think about this collectively? And I think it will involve a whole lot of people. I mean, we have to like, think about things like, wow, we need more Africanists. You know? So that means putting a lot of money in all our these departments to hire Africanists and other things to involve a, sort of a very candid conversation with students about cutting against a neoliberal logic that says 
you know, we are here to, you're paying this amount of money and we're sort of giving you this information so that you get a job, but precisely that maybe after Denison you feel almost un <coughs> unlikely to get a job. Don't say that. Yeah, don't say that. <laughs> 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 I, I would actually ask students. I mean, I want us to put that to students here. That are you? What's African studies to you, or have you taken some African studies classes, or what? What do you want from African studies? <laughs> Just a question, and this is helping me think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, actually, I, I was, that was a question that I was, I was going to ask. Um, I'm a transfer student this year, um, a sophomore, and um, I think just with, with any school generally, but especially at Denison, I think it's um, I like I, I was wondering like how can a student kind of start those those sort of studies because and and, and especially start the the unlearning that you were talking about like where where is where can we as students maybe like Madame Bukam said with this more European breath like what can where would you suggest starting um, as students um, stepping into this whole different subject matter that's that's so more detailed than we than we realize. Well yeah I I, I, I think yeah, I'd like to have a conversation about the possibilities for where where you can go and immerse yourself in studying in Africa, maybe. So a question about what are our study abroad programs that are, there they are a few, but not all of them are visible, as you said, not all of them are known. <coughs> so is there, can we have spaces for that? Like this is, this is where you can go, maybe you can go to Nairobi or this is, maybe that could be a start. Well, and I think, you know, sort of build on that when I think of my own trajectory and my own experience in, in being an undergraduate student and being 18, 19 years old, Africa wasn't really on my, my, my mental landscape um, until I just took one class with one faculty member who changed everything. Um, and I think it's just often that not to say simple, but um, you know, because that isn't to imply that every faculty member or any faculty member is going to have the same class. But I think when you find that class and you find a mentor, um, that that opens doors and opens possibilities that become so much more tangible and within reach than you know a sort of pontificating broadly. Um, my mentor got me thinking study abroad. Um, and so, after I took his class, I immediately studied abroad in Zimbabwe. Uh, when I came back to graduate, you know, he was like, what did you learn? What do you want to do next? We started talking about, you know, Peace Corps and grad school. So, I think it's often just that one person that you connect with and that mentor um, who will really say, what are, you, what are you interested in? You know, um, what are you thinking about? So I think that's something we, we just need to keep highlighting. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate your anecdote because that's actually really important. And I think much like many students, it's all about exposure, right? Like without exposure, you don't know what you want to do. And that's the beauty of Denison being a little arts school. You're exposed to lots of different things. And I think to sort of tackle your question about um, what is the place for African studies at Denison University, I think because there isn't that visibility um, of African studies, 
students aren't aware that that is an opportunity for learning and that it's a, life, um, a pursuit that they can take. Um, I actually considered doing that sophomore year at Denison and because the network and the ability, the visibility rather, wasn't clear, I sort of kind of lost foot of that. Um, and, and I will say there is a need for African citizens so because there is a need for African studies mainly because there is, we learn that lots of different continents or well, especially within the Western and European world, um, there are Africans, African history has influenced so many different parts of the world. And because of that, African studies should be integrated in all of our studies, or it should be something that students are exposed to, not on the superficial level of, oh, colonialism happened, as we typically get in most of our classes, even if you do go into depth in like pre-colonial Africa or post-colonial Africa, you don't quite get a good picture of the relationships between different continents um, and Africa. Um, and also, not even just that, we don't get a picture of what was really Africa before colonialism. Like, it's just, so Africa needs to be something that, well, African studies rather, should be something that's presented at universities, especially, especially at Denison, given that we have opportunities to study abroad. I think, and as a student personally, I believe there is a need for that because my community, um, or more so my, as a member of the African Association, we sometimes find that there's conflicts um, when we talk to our peers who haven't studied abroad or haven't had that exposure to um, that material. So there's definitely a need. Um, how does that work? I'm not quite sure, but as a student, I, I, this is a very fruitful discussion, but I think we will have to end here because we are seven minutes past the time that was out of it. So, um, Professor Gorm is still here until Monday morning. If you would like to meet with him, maybe. Um, can email me and uh, I will arrange for some time to meet with you. Thank you. Thank you.